It may be the second most important political job in the country. Premier of Ontario. In the last nearly 150 years, only 24 men and one woman have had the job. Books to balance, priorities to make, an electorate to satisfy, and opposition parties to appease. Tonight, five former premiers share their stories, including number 24, Dalton McGuinty, who's just completed his memoirs. That's all tonight on The Agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. He was the first Liberal leader in more than 120 years to win three consecutive elections. This after his political opponents twice tried to convince Ontarians during election campaigns that he, quote, wasn't up to the job. Now, Ontario's 24th Premier has written his memoirs. The new book is called Making a Difference. And we're pleased to welcome Dalton James Patrick McGinty, Jr. Back to TVO for a feature interview on his life in and out of politics. Pleasure seeing you again. Good to see you, Steve. Uh, I guess that's funny, eh? The, the first thing I learned about the book is that uh, you're not called Dalton when you're growing up, right? You're Jamie. That's correct. In order to avoid confusion at home, my dad had the same name, hmm. right? So uh, my mother called me Jamie, and that stuck. My grandmother called me Jim. And in fact, later on, um, probably when I was around the age of 12, my father nicknamed me Mick, and I was known as Mick to him. All those different names. Yeah. Here are, for everybody's reminder, uh, some of the highlights of the McGinty record when you were the Premier of Ontario. Uh, we had the creation of the Ontario Health Premium, which came as a result of that first budget. We had the creation of the Green Belt and protecting those lands there. The creation of the Harmonized Sales Tax. The creation of Full Day Kindergarten. The McGinty government helped save General Motors and Chrysler during troubled times. There was the closing of all of Ontario's coal-fired energy generation stations. And, of course, as I alluded to off the top, three election victories in 2003, 07, and 2011. Let me start here. Only one, uh, 25 premiers, and I think only Bob Ray, has written his memoirs. It is generally, for some reason, not done. Mm -hmm. So why did you feel a need to do it? Well, I've written the book for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I wanted my children and grandchildren to have a personal record of my, of, uh, my uh, public life. There are all kinds of public records and narratives that have developed over the years, but the fact of the matter is that people have to infer what I was thinking or speculate as to my motivation. So I thought it was important for them to have that, uh, that personal record. The other, the other thing, of course, is that I, um, I felt a sense of responsibility. I had the privilege to serve Ontarians for an extended period of time in politics, and uh, I learned a lot of lessons in leadership along the way, and I thought it was important to share those with others. We did some really big things in government. We'll take some time, I'm sure, to cover that. Mm -hmm. uh, I led an activist government. Uh, I'm not the kind who, of leader who chose to passively preside over the evolution of events in Ontario. I thought uh, you should take the bull by the horns and drive change, and that is what I did. So I've shared a number of lessons with people about leadership in the book, Steve. So I think ultimately, I hope that I inspire a few people of whatever political stripe mm -hmm. to um, understand how rewarding uh, politics uh, can be and to find a way to make a difference through politics uh, in their own lives. In some respects, I hate like hell to do this to you because I want to start with the worst night of your life, but it's the night that actually allows you to become the politician you became, and you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. Let's read this excerpt from your book. I got a call from my brother Michael, who was staying with my parents. He yelled into the phone, Jamie, get the hell over here. I drove over as quickly as I could. On my arrival, I discovered a scene on the back deck I will never forget. My father was lying on his back, and my mother was giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I eased my mother away and took over the artificial respiration. We kept this up while we waited for the ambulance to arrive. When it finally did, and the attendants took my father away on a stretcher, we got in my car and followed on behind to the hospital where the doctor informed us that my father had passed away from a heart attack. He was 63 years old. Okay, a bunch of stuff to unpack here. Let's, let's start with this kind of odd observation. 
you are 60 now. You are within three years of your father's death. Right. Uh, do you ever think about that? I do. I do. And uh, in part, um, that was the motivation for me to um, uh, retire from politics and to understand that um, uh, there's more to life than just politics, as, as, as rewarding and as noble a pursuit uh, that is. Uh, and I wanted to find a way, ultimately, to spend a bit more time with my, uh, my family. Steve, you know that to me, the beginning, the middle, and the end is, is family. And uh, my dad was a powerful influence for good in my life. And uh, as um, unexpected and as tragic as that uh, loss was for me uh, of my father, and, and the greatest regret I have about my time in politics is he, he, he never saw me get nominated. He never saw me win as, as uh, my first election or to, to sit in opposition. He never saw me get elected as leader. He never saw me. He saw none elected. of it. He saw none of it, yeah. But in a, in a way, you know, um, he was there throughout in the sense that it was his, his example. Uh, you know, one of his favorite lectures at the table was it was never going to be good enough to grow up and get a job and pay taxes. Everybody does that. You need to find a way to make a difference. So. Um, I was uh, proud to carry on the tradition. I can remember a couple of weeks after the funeral, I come home to Terry, I say, "Hun, I think I gotta run. She says, we've got four kids under eight. There's no way you're gonna run. And I said, that's very sensible. Uh, <laughs> but I think I've gotta run, and, and I did. I do wanna take you back now to the conversation you had with your wife about yeah. why you should run. I guess we'll set the scene here. I know the joke is, the story is that, uh, you know, all the kids are sitting around and, and you know, who's going to run in dad's place? And you say, well, we got a garage full of signs with my name on it. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But, but really, why did you end up being the guy, given what a ridiculous proposition it was that you, no money, barely with a roof over your head, four kids, yeah. all young, a wife who didn't want you to do it, right. how'd you end up being the guy? Well, it was... Um... Uh, it, was, it was, first of all, the issue was not um, whether a McGinty was going to run. That was never the issue. One of them was. The issue was which one of us is going to run. We had worked, we had worked very hard on my dad's campaign and in his um, political life, uh, and uh, he'd built a foundation. I guess we should say, he was the Ottawa he South was the MPP from 87 to 90. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, uh, just timing worked out best for me. And it's funny that um, uh, it was my brother David who originally expressed uh, uh, the keenest uh, interest in, in running. Uh, but then it became obvious he had children even younger than mine, and he was um, working with uh, UNICEF in, in uh, Abidjan, I think it was at the time. So it, just, it was really going to be very disruptive to his personal life. So it worked out, and uh, uh, Terry, as I say, was, was never uh, a huge fan and doesn't remain a huge fan of politics, uh, which was actually very helpful to me throughout because she was a good leveler. Hmm. And her mind was at where the overwhelming majority of Ontarians were at. Leading busy lives, not overly engaged with or interested in politics. Hmm. So that always kept me on kind of a, on, a, on a level playing field, you know. Okay, 1990, you're the one new Liberal MPP elected in what was otherwise a debacle for the Ontario Class Liberals. Class of 1990 sitting right here with you today. That's it, that's it. And you won't remember this, but I sure do. You and I had lunch shortly thereafter because I wanted to get to know the one new Liberal member. And during the course of that lunch, because of course David Peterson had lost not only the election but his own seat and your party would be embroiled in a leadership convention soon, you actually mentioned in that lunch to me, I'm thinking I might want to run for the leadership of this party someday. And I remember thinking, this guy doesn't know where the bathroom is at Queen's Park yet. What the hell is he thinking? But you did, and you won from fourth place on the first ballot and a worse fourth place on the second ballot. Have you ever in your life seen a screwier leadership convention than the one you won at 4.30 in the morning? No, no, in terms of how long it, it uh, took to uh, arrive at the final result uh, and in terms of the kind of the bouncing around that I did uh, that day. But I had worked uh, long and hard to ensure that I would achieve some momentum there on the floor, Steve. I had. Uh, I knew that nobody was going to win this thing in the first ballot. There were just too many of us going after it. Um, so I spent a lot of time connecting with individual delegates. And at a very simple pitch, I hear you're, you're supporting so-and-so. I've got a lot of time for so-and-so. I hope that so-and-so does well. But let me tell you something. Should so-and-so fall off the ballot, I would be honored 
to have your support. And that worked. It did work. You were a lot of people's second choice by the yes. end of the night. Yeah. You were in this studio shortly after winning. And the weird thing is, you don't look a hell of a lot different. Um, how many? That was 1996. Yeah. Almost 20 years later, you don't look. Look at the monitor over my shoulder. Let's roll that clip, please. I had many, many people today either call me or stop me on the street and say, who the hell is Dalton McGinty? Right. So let me ask you, who the hell are you anyway? What do you want to tell people? Well, I'm uh, a fresh start for my, for my party. Um, I've got some background in politics. I've been there for six years. I have, a, I guess, a family history of politics. My father had a seat before me. And I'm somebody who believes that politics is an honorable profession and that people working together can do good things. I also am a firm believer in liberal philosophies and values. What do you think when you see that guy? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, I guess I'm, I, li I like my values and I like my idealism, Steve. And I think that one of, the, one of the comments I make in the book, and I invite people to join politics, but don't look to politics to provide you with your values. Right? And, and, and with your principles. You've you better got to have them going in. You better have them going in. And when I listened to myself in that clip, and, uh, or I read my maiden speech, uh, it was filled with a powerful sense of idealism. And, and you need that because uh, it can be a corrosive atmosphere. It can rob you of your idealism. It can turn you into a cynic. Uh, and I don't think anybody wants to be led by a cynic. I think people, people prefer hope uh, over fear and division any day. In 1999, you had your first election as Ontario Liberal leader, and the Tories put ads on television saying you weren't up to the job. Right. And in this book, you admit that the guy we just saw in yeah. that clip yeah. was not up to the job, right? Yeah. Yeah. You weren't ready. No, I wasn't ready. Um, I, and, and, it, and it took an election for me to, to, to better understand that. You come back uh, four years later, and you win in 2003. Yeah. How are you a different guy in 03 from the guy who ran in 99? Well, I knew a lot more about myself. right? I knew more about the issues, obviously. I, I was a better communicator. I had taken some training in that regard. You went to Chicago. I went to Chicago. You saw David Axelrod, saw the guy David who helped Axel make Obama president. Yes. Yeah. And, and then you fired him. Uh, and then we let him go, yeah. <laughs> we, we, What's the story there? We got what we needed oh, from him. I see, OK. We got what we needed from him. Which but, was what? Um, um, helping me be a stronger and more effective communicator. And, and this is kind of how it works. You're in the biz. You're a professional. And for people coming into politics for the first time, uh, this element of communication is kind of a new thing. And this is how it kind of works. If you have good training, this is what I learned. The first thing they tell you is you need to sit in this kind of a way. The next thing they tell you is um, certain kinds of clothing is distracting. The next thing they tell you is you've got a mannerism that you don't know you have, but it really bugs people. The next thing they tell you is some of the language you use is hard to understand. The next thing to tell you is, you know, you're using your hands too much. This, I was going to ask, yeah, the yeah. stuff you're doing with your hands yeah, yeah, right now, yeah. did you learn that from him? No, no. So, <laughs> okay. but, but the point is, you know where you end up? Mm. At your very best, you end up as yourself. You've removed the distractions, and then you're more able to be open to people, and when you're open to people, they're more open to you. So anyway, he, he was one of, of a number of individuals that, that helped me in that regard. You tell us in the book that you and Stephen Harper never got along. Mm -hmm. You didn't, you just weren't able to connect with him, even in private. Right. How come? Let me say this off the top. Um, I'm grateful that uh, Stephen Harper got into politics and devoted himself to public service. We need more people from all political stripes to do, to do the very same kind of thing. But my problem with the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Harper, was uh, he's a very partisan guy, uh, and he could never kind of set that uh, aside. I find it, found it very difficult to establish a connection. The other one was that, you know, he was always kind of a guy, you know, he never wanted me to forget that he was the prime minister and I was the premier. And the funny thing is, I learned in your book that um, Mike Harris, with whom I would have assumed you had a horrible relationship, yeah. actually called you on election night after he beat you and yeah. said, hang in there, kid. Yes. Yeah. What was yeah. that about? Well, let me tell you about that, because... Um, um, not only did he do that for me, when Stephen Harper lost his first election, I phoned him, as I did all, as I did all the federal leaders. I was then premier and said, "Thanks for running. Thanks for your commitment to public service." I said, "By the way, you've uh, you've just earned a lot of you've, you've acquired a lot of experience," because he sounded very down at the time. Uh, and I said, "I think I said something to the effect of, you, you don't want to throw that away.'" Um, but I 
that was a lesson I actually got from Mike Harris. Mike Harris phoned me and said, I know what it's, I've been there. I know what it's like. And he had. He, he had been there, he'd right? Lost, he'd lost before he won. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I hope to do with my book is to kind of break through that partisanship, which is unfortunately uh, descended in Ontario as it has throughout the country, the U.S. and the U.K., much of the Western world, into a poisonous state where it's compromising the public interest. Uh, but that was a good, you know, a good little insight. And I should tell you as well, Steve, that after, um, after the election, after my retirement, a couple of years later, Mike uh, Harris and I were at a, uh, a golf tournament. And uh, so I saw him, I went and said hello to him. People were delighted to take some pictures of us together and all this. I said, and I said, Mike, I said, people could be forgiven in the last election here in Ontario for thinking I was still uh, the premier. He said, what do you mean? I said, because of all the, uh, the attack as you ran against this head. He says, now you know how I felt for 13 years. <laughs> so we had a laugh mm. about it. And he said, if you ever want to have a beer, let's do that. And we did that. You did. And we did. And you know, there's something that happens, ideally, when you are when you remove yourself from the front lines, from active duty as a politician. You see how much more you had in common than you understood at the time. Okay, except that I remember a moment in the legislature where you were going at him pretty hard, and he came back at you and said, if your father were alive today, he would be ashamed mm -hmm. of the demonstration you've put on here today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that sort of violates one of the cardinal rules in politics, which is you don't bring family into it, right? Right. right. So I always wondered whether you, did you ever go up to him afterwards and say anything about that? I didn't. I didn't, and so what flows from that circumstance? I think, at our best, my job is to forgive and forget. His job is to understand what he did and to make sure he doesn't do it again. Did he apologize? No, no, no. Did you want one? Would have been nice. But you know, you got to move on. Okay, here comes my first. I know you, uh, you're a hockey guy as opposed to a baseball guy, but here comes my first high fastball. 2011. Yeah. You come up one seat short of a majority government on election night. Yeah. You'd have been the first guy since Leslie Frost in the 1950s to win three straight majorities. How ticked off were you on election night? <laughs> well, first of all, I was, I was uh, honored. Uh, to yeah, yeah, I to, know. No, 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 no. But seriously, <laughs> one seat short. No. I was honored to uh, have won a third mandate. Uh, not something that's done very often. Would have been nice to have one more seat, but uh, uh, you know, you've got to accept the um, uh, the outcome awarded you by by the voters. So I was uh, filled with a powerful sense of idealism. I said, I'm going to find a way to make this work. Uh, and uh, I remember talking to Prime Minister Harper, in fact. He said, you know, he says, you're going to find it hard. And I said, what do you mean? He says, better to have the minority first and the majority after mm. than to go from majority to minority. He's right about that, isn't he? He is right about that. And the other thing that I had was, of course, I had, and I referenced this in the book, uh, called Making a Difference, a better available at fine <laughs> bookstores everywhere. Um, um, I had uh, an opposition that was sick and tired of me. I wasn't supposed to win in 2003 because I, I wasn't up to the job. I wasn't supposed to win in 2007 because I'd raised taxes. I wasn't supposed to win in 2011 because I'd brought in the HST. And I was back again. So they were in no mood to make nice with a guy they'd been dying to get out of power for a long time. And now we found, found ourselves in a minority circumstance. So this was not what you call setting the table for success. You pointed out already that the education system in the province of Ontario, by internationally judged standards, went way up under your tenure. We Let's up give you the, that. We ended, ended up in the top five. Yes, you did. Uh, and part of the reason that worked is because after teachers felt that they'd been picked on for eight years by the, uh, Mike Harris and Ernie Eves, uh, you took a different approach. Uh, part of it was financial and part of it was you know, just sort of offering them more respect than they felt they'd had in the past. But then when the books got into trouble, you went to the teachers' unions and you said, I need your help. We've got to freeze your pay because we're in deep doo-doo here financially. And their response was to kick you right in the you-know-what. And I wonder whether you came away with any conclusions about the advisability of spending all of those years trying to ingratiate is the wrong word, but certainly to make, you know, to have a good constructive relationship with the teacher unions 
when at the first sign of trouble, they were so out of there and on you like white on rice. Yeah, yeah. I was disappointed. I was disappointed. Uh, we had worked long and hard together. We had secured the first uh, four-year agreements. They were back-to-back, -back, so we had secured peace. Uh, this was all about um, enhancing the quality of learning conditions for students. That's what this was all about. Uh, I had created something that was brand new to Ontario, the, te te the uh, Premier's Awards for Teaching Excellence. Mm -hmm. I wanted to um, elevate uh, teaching in the minds of Ontarians as a profession, which is incredibly important to all of us. Uh, there had been eight successive years of pay raises. I had, I had increased prep time, time away from the students to um, ensure that there's a better teaching experience available. I think I'd increased uh, professional development time as well. So I thought I had done a lot. And the great thing was, Steve, we were getting results. It's one thing to hire 10,000 more teachers, as I did. It's one thing to build 600 new schools, as I did. Uh, it's another thing to introduce full-day kindergarten, as I did. But at the end of the day, you've got to get results that you can point to Ontarians. So as I said, test scores went up 15 points, graduation rates went up 15 points. So I was happy with the progress. But then we get, you know, kicked in the head by a terrible economic recession, uh, and uh, it affected our books. And I needed to be able to call upon um, Ontarians, but especially uh, my partners, uh, my public sector partners. So I was, I was uh, disappointed when teachers didn't respond in the way I'd hoped they would. Now, eventually, we got agreements with, with uh, two of the federations, but we had to impose on two others. You, you had to legislate. What's the lesson in all of that? I wouldn't change a thing that I did in terms of, of the working hard to build a good working relationship with teachers. But um, you need to understand at the end of the day, uh, they may not be there for you when you need them. Your favorite subject here. Let us acknowledge. What am I going to ask you about? What am I going to Go ahead. What's your favorite subject in the whole world? <laughs> gas plants. You got it. Here we go. <laughs> Let us acknowledge that 90% of the gas plants that your government cited happened without any controversy at all. There were willing communities to take those gas plants and everything went tickety-boo. Would you, speaking of naivete, acknowledge that it may have been a tad naive on your part in the dying days of an election campaign to have cancelled the Mississauga gas plant assuming that people would take that decision on the merits and think there was no politics involved? Um, first of all, I wouldn't change what I did. Uh, and you're right, I should have been more alive to um, the uh, cynical interpretation uh, afforded to my decision, which is, by the way, was a decision that was made by um, uh, the opposition parties. Let me say this as well. The, well you um, made the decision, but they agreed with it. They agreed with you it, You were yeah. on the same page. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I recall, I recall the Conservatives during the campaign saying, you can't trust McGinty to shut down this gas plant. You can only trust us to do it. But the th interesting thing, Steve, was that um, when these two gas plants became controversial, I was surprised to learn we had already built 18 other gas plants. You see, we had delegated authority to the Ontario Power Authority to build these new gas plants. We this were a neutral arm's length a body. A neutral arm's length body, yeah. Supposedly removed from politics. Removed from politics, theoretically. Mm -hmm. Uh, to help us replace some of the power that we had um, lost as a result of getting rid of, of our dirty coal-fired generation. So I discovered that we'd, we'd built 18 others in places like Toronto, Brampton, and Windsor. So it tells me there is a right way to locate these things and a wrong way to locate these things. These two were wrongly located. They were located in sites where I couldn't locate a single wind turbine. So we were going to build a gas plant, one of the biggest in North America, the size of a hospital, beside a hospital. Right. Um, so we got it wrong. And my responsibility, as I saw it, was to step in and make it right. The communities were adamantly opposed for all the right reasons. These, were re these two gas plants were relocated to communities that wanted them. Again, there is a right way and a wrong way to locate these gas plants. Fair enough. But when you cancel a gas plant, even when the opposition parties share the same position on yeah. it, and you do it, I forget, was it three or four or five days before Election Day? You, you've got to expect that people are going to say, oh, my God, you're not doing this on the merits. You're doing it to save some seats around Mississauga. Yeah, but that's not how I operate. Right? I had made a decision to relocate a gas plant, gas plant in Oakville about a year earlier. Right? 
because I thought it was the right thing to do. So I remember when Brendan and Chris Morley came to see me on the bus and said, look, we got a big is issue with this gas plant thing, right? And they knew that, uh, and I described this in the book, for me to make a decision and uh, be happy about it, I've got to do it because I think it's the right thing to do. I brought the same thinking to bear in the heat of an election um, for the Mississauga gas plant that I did in the cool, dry atmosphere a year earlier before we were in an election when it came to the Oakville gas plant. It was wrongly located. My responsibility was to rightly locate it. Okay, That's the, why I did that. The next problem after that, though, was that somehow it got out there that canceling this contract to build the Mississauga gas plant was only going to cost 40 million bucks. Right. And as we see from further studies, and the Auditor General has had her look at it and so yeah. on and so forth, I mean, who knows? It'll be 20 years before we really find out what the total cost was, but the estimates now are around a billion, right. which is a long way from 40 million. Yes. Which, when those two numbers came out, right. people said, why the hell is McGinty lying to us about right. this? Right, right. And I talk about this at some length in the book as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, two things that we should have done, that I should have done when it came to the gas plant issue. Number one is, uh, it's one thing to create um, agencies like eHealth, Orange, uh, and the OPA, and say, go out there and, and, and do your stuff. But at the end of the day, nobody knows who the head of the OPA is, or Orange, or eHealth. They know you. But they know this head. Yeah, they do. Right? And if something goes wrong, they want this head. I should have paid closer to attention to uh, what it was that the OPA was doing so that I could head off um, any uh, obvious uh, problems before they became expensive uh, propositions. That's issue number one. I should have been on top of that. Number two, uh, when it came, came to costing, it quickly became apparent to me not only did we not have the capacity inside my office to cost this thing, it's a very complicated thing, we did not have the capacity inside the government to cost these things within the Ministry of Energy. So the first number that I got was $40 million, and I said, I remember a very good conversation with my staff, I said, I'm not going out there and saying $40 million if we're not absolutely confident that this is $40 million. Oh no, we got it from the energy experts. So I went out and gave the number. Ultimately, it took the provincial auditor to come in with a costing. And again, that's only projected. It's an estimate as to what it would cost over the course of some 20 years to relocate and supply the electricity from that location all the way to the intended destination. So uh, not a, uh, not the best uh, uh, government on my part. I uh, acknowledge that. I regret that it, that it came out that way. But Steve, my motivation for making the decision is as strong today. I would do that if that were in your writing or anybody else's writing for that matter. You, you've used the same words just now that you used when this happened. Acknowledge, regret. You know that there were people who wanted you to apologize. You've never used that word. Right. How come? Right. Well, um, I'm not going to apologize for doing what I think is right. Um, the gas plants were wrongly located. It was right for me to move them. Kathleen Wynne was in that chair and used the word apologize 11 times. Uh, let me read the quote. Here we go. This is from your book. It was a mistake for me to delegate decisions to locate gas plants to the energy experts. While it's true the experts got 18 out of 20 right, those last two more than established why I should have kept this responsibility inside my government. I take full responsibility for this failing, and I deeply regret this. I also regret that my successor, Premier Kathleen Wynne, and her government had to spend so much time on this issue. She came here to the studio, she apologized 11 times for it as she was walking out of the studio after the cameras were off, she looked at me and she said, I hate this issue, and who can blame her? My question is, do, did you at any point in any of this worry that you had passed on a poison chalice to her? I knew that I had created a challenge, but you know, Steve, I have an abiding faith in Ontarians, uh, and I thought that uh, had I been advising the opposition parties, as I say again in my book, I would have said, uh, folks, you're overplaying your hand. Uh, this is, these are, we're talking about gas plants that you lobbied the government to shut down. Uh, and now you are engaging in um, fabricated uh, outrage uh, that is clearly over the top. So for about a year, uh, my successor had to contend uh, with this um, real challenge. And they say every dog has its day. And during that year, the opposition had its day. But on election day, Ontarians had their say. 
and they decided that um, they were going to re-elect uh, a liberal government. They were going to elect for the first time a premier win government. And to me, that speaks volumes about um, placing this in context. Uh, was there any deliberate malfeasance on the part of anyone here? No. Was there a failure to provide oversight to a, a newly created government agency? Absolutely. Did we lack the capacity to come up with the numbers? Did we kind of fumble and juggle uh, in an um, embarrassing way for some time? Yes, we did. But um, um, I think at the end of the day, Ontarians placed it in context. It was, it was, it was hardly our finest hour, but uh, it was not something that was worthy of capital punishment. Well, let's talk about my exit from politics. Right? I think it was Lyndon Johnson who said, politics is like a hammock. Hard to get into, even harder to get out of. <laughs> That's a good line. There are three ways you can get out, mm -hmm. right? You can die in office, as my father did. You can be defeated, as Prime Minister Harper was. Or you can get out on your own terms. I had a number of terms that I attached to my exit from politics. One of those, and this is an important test of leadership, and Prime Minister uh, Harper was in breach of this particular uh, aspect of leadership, is item number 10 in my last chapter. Leaders know when to leave. You've got to know when to get out, right? So one of the conditions I attached was, I need to get out in a way that gives my successor a fighting chance to win the next election. In part, right, leaders, political leaders, are the liver of the party. You absorb toxins. The longer you're there, the more poisons you're going to pick up. And if you're doing your job at the end, you will remove yourself in such a way as to give your successor a fresh opportunity with a fresh face and a fresh agenda. Which you did. Which I did. How many, you ask yourself now, right? Take a look at those who preceded me. Take a look at the federal government. Who's won three in a row and then left a circumstance such that there was a fighting chance for their successor to win a fourth. So I did my job. I won my three. I, I removed myself from politics. Yes, I did go to Harvard, but that is something I've been longing to do for a long time. And I gave my, ch my, uh, my successor a great chance. And she sees that, and you know, I give her all the credit for running a great campaign, for being a person of integrity. Uh, and for making difficult decisions and always doing what she feels is right. I've known you for 25 years. It's hard to believe, but I actually have. So I know you are not a cynical person. Um, but I want to ask you this. Are you concerned, the achievements that you've talked about in this interview notwithstanding, that the public's cynicism about politics is bigger because Dalton McGuinty was premier, because he raised taxes in 2004 when he swore he wouldn't do it, because of the gas plant business, because of Orange, because of e-health, are you worried cynicism is worse, not better, because of you? Um, no. Why aren't you? I'll tell you why. Um, those, um, because of the lasting positive things that we were able to do together. I'll give you an example, right? So we've got 265,000 children who are in full day kindergarten every day as a result of changes that we made together here in Ontario. I think we found family doctors for 2.1 million more Ontarians. We've built, we've, we've we made a, a land grab for future generations. Uh, I think it's 1.2 million acres, the GTA Greenbelt. It's the biggest urban greenbelt in the world. We have found a way to get ahead of the curve when it comes to tackling climate change by shutting down our coal-fired plants and building a renewable energy sector. That's great news for Prime Minister Trudeau when he goes to Paris, right? Guess who did the heaviest lifting in the country when it comes to reducing carbon emissions? In North America, Ontarians. And Harper took credit for it at a, at a leader's debate. <laughs> On a regular basis. Like yeah, that? he did. Yeah, I loved it. Um, but uh, there are those other elements. That's true. But I think people will see the big picture. I think that... Um, people want to be, um, want to be uh, fair about themselves. This wasn't just my legacy, it's our legacy. It's what did we do in Ontario between 2003 and, two and 2013. We didn't run a perfect government, Steve, but I think when it comes to the big things, we did those well and we got them right. Let me ask you one last question. What do you miss? I miss the, uh, I miss the camaraderie. I miss the team environment. Uh, and I miss the privilege of being in a position where you're actually shaping the future. 
uh, through public policy. That's a very stimulating, intoxicating um, uh, environment, and I, I miss that a lot. That's Dalton James Patrick McGinty, Jr., 24th Premier of the province of Ontario. His new book is called Making a Difference. Good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks for having me, Steve. Thank you. Okay, in 2006, four of Ontario's former premiers were together for the first time on television here on the agenda to give an exclusive look at the second toughest political job in the country. As we now say goodbye to Ontario's 24th Premier, let's take a look at what the province's 20th, 21st, 22nd, and 23rd had to say about their time in office. Joining us now, Ernie Eves, the 23rd Premier of the province of Ontario, Mike Harris, the 22nd Premier of the province of Ontario, Bob Ray, the 21st Premier of the province of Ontario, and David Peterson, the 20th Premier of the province of Ontario. I've always wondered what it is like. I mean, David Peterson, you, you took over in the Premier's office in 1985. I want to know what that moment is like when you walk into that office that has been occupied by some pretty legendary f figures over the years, and you actually sit down in that chair and you look at that desk and you think, I'm one of, in your case, 20 people who's had this job. What goes through your head? You're going to accuse me of gross arrogance, but I remember that moment. I remember it very, very well. And I walked in, and I sat down, and I said to myself, I feel very, very comfortable. Comfortable. And Why I are you laughing, I wasn't, Bob, right? uh, I wasn't filled with trepidation. Yeah. Uh, I had a fabulous team, even though we had no... It wasn't that we had an experienced team. We'd never had anybody that had been on the government side before. But we had very capable people. We knew what we were going to do. And we started doing it. And, um, and I was, I felt very comfortable. I wasn't uh, uh, daunted by it. I wasn't overawed by it. And the truth is, politicians are just ordinary people who by chance or circumstance or luck end up where they are because they've taken some risks in their own lives. Mr. Ray, you never expected to be in that chair. When you sat in it, what did you think? Uh, well, the room was pretty empty when I got there, so I mean, it was. <laughs> it was <laughs> all your people. No, 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 no. They all ran away. No, no, no. no, no, no. With them. Thank yeah. you, David. All the furniture. Thank you, David, for asking. But no, that, that wasn't the problem. No, it, he was I, so comfortable that furniture, he took it all away. No, I, I mean, I, I guess for me there was. I mean, I, you know, again, the last two or three weeks of the election campaign was a sense of. Uh, of uh, genuine surprise. Uh, the election, the result itself was, you know, was a bit of a surprise in terms of where all the seats come out and everything. But no, I think for me, it's always a great sense of uh, of honor. I mean, you you do. I mean, it's a, it, you do feel a sense of uh, of not. Uh, I, I couldn't say I've, I, it took me a couple. It took me a year to feel comfortable in the job. I mean, I, I don't mind saying that, but I certainly feel. Uh, I think it's a sense of honor. I mean, it is, and also, frankly, it's a sense of, you know, not so much personal achievement, but, the, you know, achievement. You say, well, you know, here we are, we've done it, now let's get on with it. The thing is, though, you don't really have the luxury. I mean, the great thing about living in our democracy is you haven't got very many people around you who are saying, you know, well, you know, sir. I mean, they're, they're, you know, it's like, okay, now you're on, you've got the scrum outside, and they're waiting to see you, and they're going to ask you a question about where did you buy your shoes yesterday. And, uh, you know, you've got to, that's what you have to get used to. Mr. Harris, if you had a dollar for every time somebody told you you'd never be premier, you'd be a very rich man today. Yes, I'd be wealthy. We'd all uh, be wealthy, yeah. except for, for Ernie yeah. Eves. He, he knew when he won the leadership, he, he, knew was, he, was, going he, he was going to be premier. Absolutely nobody <laughs> thought Bob Ray was going to be including Bob Ray. And David and I, it's, it's debatable. But oh, I, I, When I, you, you sat you in know, the chair, it, it, you remember it, what you it, thought? I was, I, I, contrary to, to, to David, uh, I, I, I was scared. I was nervous. I was scared silly. I, I thought... Okay, here I am, now what? And uh, I knew it was a daunting task ahead and, and whatnot. I mean, it didn't take me long to, to get into it. And, you know, as Bob says, pretty soon you're out there in the scrum and there you're there. Could but you I, afford I, to I, share I that nervous. view with anybody? Could Sorry? you afford to share that view with anybody? Uh, nobody. Perhaps my family. Perhaps my family. My father, who I, who I used to, you, you, know, you know, confide in. Of course not. Uh, what did your dad tell you but, when you told him that? Uh, well, yeah, it, it, the same same advice that, that he gave me when when I was scared going into the election. And the night before the debate, I had to debate two giant debaters, uh, you know, that uh, that were there, that first the first debate that I had. Uh, to just, you know, be yourself. Uh, you can do it. Uh, he was he was always had a great deal of uh, faith and confidence uh, in me and it was reassuring and he he helped me through a lot part of my career. How about you? You knew you were going to be premier. When you won your leadership convention, you obviously knew you were going to be premier. Does that make it different? 
I've been in the Premier's office many times, mostly held, on, uh, held up on the carpet by uh, <laughs> my good friend Michael. But uh, it's, uh, I would say there's a great sense of, uh, of pride and uh, privilege and honor. Uh, very few people get the opportunity to lead a government in, in our democratic society, and I, I really consider it to be an honor and a privilege. Um, I can recall, Michael may recall this when I mention it, uh, he and I having a discussion one night. We had a, a very difficult agenda when we first started our, uh, our 10 years government. We had a lot of things that weren't very popular. And I can recall him uh, in the middle of a cabinet meeting, he and I taking a bit of a, a break and going into his office and he's saying, you know, do you have problems sleeping at night? Because there are some very tough decisions that have to be made. Did you have trouble sleeping and, uh, at night? I think we all probably have if we don't want to be direct about it from time to time. These are not easy decisions. Sure, once you make a decision, you go on and you implement it and you do it to the best of your ability, but we are human beings. I wonder who premiers take advice from, and in particular, whether they take advice from people who previously had the job. Did you ever call any of your predecessors or did they call you and say whatever? Uh, on certain issues, you know, uh, 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 it, Bill Davis was, uh, I valued his advice on certain uh, national issues, constitutional issues, or issues of judgments with respect to other personalities you had to deal with across the How'd country. How'd that work, though? Would you call him? I'd run into him, or um, uh, it was more informal than formal, but uh, he was pretty wise about dealing with some of these things. He had different approaches and different ways of doing things than I did. But didn't I, I, he was in a different party. No, no, no. You know, Stephen, I think one of the things you will find when you get out of the partisan game, uh, partisanship fades away, and friendship tends to take over. And, and you know, you see a lot of these people. I mean, this is, you're talking to four former f first ministers of Ontario. But you could be talking to the same former first ministers right across this nation. We all know each other. We've been engaged in debates, and these are Tories, NDPs, separatists, or whatever. And there's a friendship and common purpose is stronger than the partisanship yeah. today. I really it's believe that. Mr. Raybuth, given the way you came to office, defeating the guy beside you, my hunch is you didn't call him for advice. Uh, my not a lot come. at first, but a little bit more later on when we were dealing with the constitutional issues, okay. definitely. I spent a lot of time talking to Bill Davis, and Bill Davis had been a friend when I got into Parliament, when I got into legislature, and he was, lead, he was leader of the government. And we established a very good personal relationship, and that's maintained to this day. And I still, I still think he's got great judgment about issues and people. And he was very good about things like, you know, it, it sounds stupid, but it's the simple stuff, like, like only do so much in a day, you know, think out, try to, try to, Really, base, take care of yourself a little bit, you know, in terms of dealing with crises, the sort of things that Ernie was talking about sleeping. Uh, you know, because there are times when you lose sleep and you're not, you're, and if you lose sleep, you're not performing well. These are just sort of basic <laughs> health issues you got to deal with. I found talking after I got to know them better, the first uh, few months in office, I found talking to other first ministers was very, very helpful. I, I spent not just, you know, I, I had friends, and you know, Joe Gibbs was a great friend of David's and of mine, and. Uh, I, I admired him a lot. And Premier Pete Yai. Yeah, Premier of Prince Edward Island. Spent a lot of time with him. I talked a lot with Roy Romano and Mike Harcourt when they got into office. But uh, certainly Gary Philman from Manitoba was, uh, over time, became a very good friend. And we spent a lot of time, we would spend a lot of time at Premier's meetings just chatting about, well, how do you deal with this? Or what do you think about that? Or how, do you, how are you going to face up to this problem? And whether it was, you know, the issues we have in common in terms of education, health care. Also issues of people management. Well, you know, is it a big cabinet? Is it a small cabinet? What do you do with people who are this or that? How do you do? But there's so many common problems. And I think, I think it's learning. As you get more comfortable in the job, you, you become, uh, I think, much more at ease with talking to other people about, well, how do you make this decision? What did you do that for? Why would you, how would you do it that way? And you start to really admire people. I mean, I think everybody, every other premier admired Frank McKenna for the way in which he was able to make decisions and for his ability to focus on some of the key issues facing his province. And, mm. and given the amount of time that Frank used to spend in Toronto in those days, you'd get to see him quite a lot. <laughs> Mr. Harris, who he was hunting? He, he was hunting. What previous premiers would you have called? I, I, well, uh, all kinds. And, and I think uh, that, that we touched on certainly not limited to, to Ontario, not limited to your province. But you never would have called Bob Rayford, would you? Uh, Bob and I, Chad, again, I would say it would be more later on. No, but not, the not, not really, stuff but the constitutional stuff and, and uh, uh, some of those, uh, and, and, and we all got together, uh, uh, all of us, I think, when it came to how the, the, to, how to the, the bitterness you know, of, of How does the bitterness of 
election losses or victories that well, will not overcome all of well, that. Well, I, I, I don't know how much bitterness there is. There's disappointment. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, that there's, great, there's great bitterness, but I think you overcome it by, I mean, when it came to, to the referendum, which was shortly after my watch, it's the commonality of purpose and, and, and of what we all agreed uh, was important, and we were united on, on that issue. And there's many issues we would have been uh, united on, I wonder and, if Bob, and that, that, that helps overcome any of the disagreements of the past. I wonder, Bob yeah. Ray, if you would, if, if, if I'm right in saying that Mike Harris takes over June 1995. There's a referendum in October of 1995 where the future of the country is at stake. And you've been premier for the previous five years and obviously think you've got a pretty good handle on these issues. And the guy beside you had been premier for five years and had his Meech Lake uh, adventure as well. Do you not at some point in your inner recesses think, I could be handling this way better than this guy and unfortunately he's there and I'm not? No, no actually, actually, uh, it, it, I mean, not, not. I mean, no, because it, it, because it's a, it's 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 a it's a futile uh, expenditure of emotion. Mike and I, uh, I went over to Mike's office at his request yeah. uh, when I was still in uh, still in the house, and we went over and we talked about the issue. We went over and said Mike was giving a speech at the Canadian Club yeah. and the Empire Club, one of those places, and said, "What what do you think?" And I said, "Well, I'll do whatever you like." He said, "I'd like you to be on the on the podium with me." I said, "I'll be on the podium with you." He says he wants Ontario to be, you know, expressing itself in a clear way. I said, I think that's very important for that to happen. And yeah, he asked, help, help write the speech. He asked me for advice on what should I say in the speech. I said, well, here's some of the things. I'd, I'll go and write you some stuff if some of it was in the speech. You know, and I don't regard that as a strange thing. I mean, to me, that's what you would expect your, your politicians to do at a moment of, of national okay. crisis. Ernie Eves, can you give me an example of a, of a time you would have called one of your predecessors and what the issue I've have been talked about? to everybody here uh, one time or another uh, David gave me advice uh, at a Christmas party at my house and I thought it was very good advice quite what was it about? To, to look at the broad picture to not get too caught up in in the details and his comment to me was that you know if he had it to do all over again he might take more time looking at the broad picture that was helpful advice I talked to Bob many times uh, phoned Bob for advice about different things um, he, I don't know if he remembers this, but when I, we were in opposition and you were the government, uh, Charlie Harnick and I were, a member of the, were members of the Constitutional Committee that traveled around the country, and he literally would not start a meeting without me being there and, and sought out advice and asked me what I thought. And Michael, of course, has been a great personal friend and provided a lot of advice to me, uh, both when I was finance minister and premier. I, I relied upon uh, Premier Davis many, many times. I think that we all agree that uh, I really respect his uh, his perspective of public service, and he was always somebody you could go to. I, I just I think it is fair to say one thing. You know, we, we we say we're not different. There is something different about being premier. I I would say that 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 uh, uh, seeking out other premiers' opinions and those that had, had the file probably took place a lot more than than. Than just a cabinet minister level or a, or a caucus yeah, yeah. member. I mean, the nonpartisan nature. And perhaps, you know, David, you alluded to the first minister's meetings. We, we had a lot of common cause. Some of them were beating up on the federal government, but there were a lot of commonality, and we got to know each other pretty well. Uh, and so I, I think it, 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 it is a club that is exclusive, and it is a club that, that like, I never once felt if I consulted uh, a, a former premier, I never once felt that was going to leak into the press or that, that, yeah. that, that I would be betrayed uh, in that. Whereas as I don't think I would have had that same confidence uh, with, with some ministers or, or some other. There was just a certain respect there. What do you mean very, you very, very just well. Just well. Michael, <laughs> probably the most intense experience of my political life was with involved in the constitutional negotiation. Uh, and Bob was there. Bob was leader of the opposition. And Bob was invited around, included in all the briefings. His advice was sought. And so was Michael. Yeah, you were there too. too. And, and yeah. I didn't consider the partisan issue. This was, in my, I viewed it then as I still view it as probably one of the most important issues in the history of the country. But I made friends out of that. You know, uh, you know, Peter, the Peter Lougheeds, the Don Gettys, the Gary Films, the Frank McKenna's, the Robert Barassa was a very dear friend of mine. And the guy that really let everybody the country down was a liberal, Clyde Wells, in my opinion. Uh, no, I, I realize that not everybody shares my view on that, but the point is it wasn't partisan. There were many, many <laughs> issues way beyond our partisanship, our political affiliation, or our provincial affiliation. It was about this country. 
And somehow or other, a lot of good people rallied around that flag at a lot of important times in the history of this Canada, not this country, and I include my three friends here. Yeah. I know all of you have talked today about uh, the parts of the job that you love the most. I would like to get a little sense about what the necessary evils are in being Premier that you really couldn't stand to do. Bob Ray, what was something on the job you really didn't like doing? Uh, firing people. Dealing with personnel problems. Dealing with, I don't know, you know, uh, any cabinet change. Sometimes you just make a change because you've got to make a change. That's always very stressful. It's not just, it's also, the, you're also responsible for appointing deputies. So you've got to look at all, you know, do you need to make a change in, the, in deputy ministers, people? Do you have to make some difficult decisions with respect to uh, people's personal conduct or something that's happened? I, I don't think anybody enjoys those experiences. Uh, the premier who's not here uh, told me that he thought it was the worst part of the job without any question. In fact, uh, the late Eddie Goodman, who uh, is no longer with us, used to tell me <laughs> that he did it for him. So I don't know whether that's true or not. But I do know that I think that's the, that's the toughest. It goes with the territory. You have to do it. Uh, Firing Peter Cormos was really hard? Uh, well, no, that, some of them are a little easier. <laughs> some of them are easier than others. But I, don't, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's getting used to doing that and knowing how to do it well and then, and then me moving on quickly. Because you can't afford, I mean, the one thing about this job is you can't, you can't afford too much time for remorse or second thoughts or, well, what if, or, you, you can't, you know, you've just got to get on and do it. And, and, the, and the day you do it is the next day you're up in the house saying, it was the greatest thing in the world, and it was fine, it was intelligent, and you got the leader of the opposition telling you what a Hardest part of the job, job Mike Harris? Well, I, 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 I think Bob has touched on, on part of it, and I, and I don't disagree with that. But that, that, what differentiates the Premier from any other CEO? That's tough for any CEO, yeah. that, that, that part of the job. The, the picking one over the other in, in selection of cabinet, letting some go, staff, personnel. What does differentiate, what is different, I think, from, from most companies and most CEOs? Uh, is that we are also the chief spokesman for your party in critiquing the other leaders come election time. Uh, so you're the one that's to point out uh, Bob Ray's weaknesses. You're the one that's to point out all the things that he's terrible at, you didn't and like all doing the things that? that he's wrong. You never had no. trouble doing that. No, I, well, <laughs> you, you, no, no, I, I don't want to get into how much was there, but but that that's not fun. And and I don't think you don't see the CEO of, of Burger King going out running down down McDonald's or whatnot. You know, I mean, it's it, because we're, we're, we we come to our job a little different way at election time, and a big part of campaigning now is is. Yes, it's positive. What's your platform? What's there? But it's also you are expected to critique the other guy's performance and the other guy's uh, or, or girl's uh, uh, past and record. Take, and you know that I, I didn't enjoy that. Let's take a look at what uh, we had a good laugh seeing what David Peterson looked like in 1982. How about Ernie Eves in 1995? I, uh -oh. I know you we were all magnificent, Adonis. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to laugh at here's, whatever I'm next. <laughs> here's, here's Ernie Eves 11 years ago okay, when he was Mike Harris's that. finance minister, and we want to talk about tough parts of the job. You came in and. I think in the first couple of months of the job, you cut more than $2.5 billion worth of spending like that, and not everybody thought it was a great idea. That's, That's what we true. weren't sleeping too good. That's right. Tape. <laughs> our government has a renewal plan for Ontario that will restore our financial and social well-being through economic stability and job creation. The plan is based on three building blocks, balancing the budget, and squarely facing grave personal and economic costs of high levels of debt. First of all, should I ask you about the hair? <laughs> the hair. No, let's move on. Let's move on. Hair's changed a bit. It has. Uh, everybody assumes that it's hard to do what you did. I know you thought it was necessary to do. When you look back at it, was it as difficult as we thought at the time? It was difficult, but the thing that helped us, of course, is we had a, a very good plan, I felt, that, that you could follow. I think if you get elected and you don't have a plan, I think it may be a lot more difficult. But I really thought that, uh, you know, we did it fairly well, if I do say so myself. Although a lot of decisions were not easy because you're affecting people's lives. Was it easier and, to become Premier? you have to look at the broader good. Was it easier to become Premier? Uh, none of these three had any experience in government before they became Premier. You did. You were a finance minister, which is about as close as you get. Did that make being Premier easier? Uh, in a way it did, in a way it did not. Uh, in a way it did because you've been exposed to, and uh, uh, Mike included me in many, many things, so I was all part of those dis dis discussions and decisions. However, the, the part that made it more difficult, I think, is that sometimes you know too much. 
I mean, you know, all the intricacies of finance, of all the ministries of the government, and you get bogged down in detail as opposed to looking at the broad picture in a broader perspective. So I would say, again, it was, uh, there's two sides to the coin. Mm. Worst part of the job, David Peterson? I was thinking about that when Michael and Bob were talking, and I, and I actually agree with them. But I think, I think it was a harder part for me. It was, it was just this constant, unbearing scrutiny. You come in in the morning, and there's guys <laughs> trying to beat you up. And you leave at night, and, there's, and you go into question period, and they want to beat you up. So it's and then media when you're leaving, and opposition. And, and media, all of right? that. Yeah, well, it, it, it's they a combination of all of that. You're always on display, and there's a lot of gotcha stuff in politics. And... And um, did you accept that as part of the yes, theater of the job? Yes, absolutely. I'm not whining about this, but you ask me what the tougher, the, 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 personally, and I don't miss that part of politics at all. That 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 endless scrutiny, trying absolutely. to prove you're stupid or, or jump on you, or or, or or go after you. And and people have to understand this. I, I use this analogy: is when you're the first minister, you have all of the responsibility for everything. And everybody, half of the people, by definition, do not like you. Would like you out of there, and would like you to look, make you make you look stupid. And there's so much violent criticism of each other in this business. It's no wonder people have so little respect for the so system. So when you it appears that politicians have so little respect, so why don't you all tone it down? I hate to tell you, Stephen, it's been going on for 400 years. This is nothing new about this, but we just see it all now with television and instantaneous yeah. transmission of all this. And we're so hard on ourselves when we're involved in the partisan game, it's no wonder that most people think that politicians are not very nice people. David Peterson, Bob Ray, Mike Harris, Ernie Eves from season one of The Agenda. And that is The Agenda for Monday, November 23rd, 2015. Tomorrow on the program, staying in the leadership realm, we'll talk to business leaders about what works, what doesn't, and what it takes to take a chance. Hope you can join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.